Hi everyone and welcome back to the shack for another episode in our Spectrum Next journey where we'll be maxing out our Next by fitting the final upgrades including this real time clock module. This will allow the Next to retain time and date settings when the power is turned off. There are a few components to solder here and we'll go through them all as we fit them to the Next. We'll also go through what benefits this module brings so you can decide if it's something you need or whether you can get by without it. Next we'll be fitting this small piezo speaker. It's really not needed as by default the next output sound through the HDMI port, but I guess if you're plugging into an old VGA monitor then this might be for you. And lastly, and this is not for the faint hearted, we'll be installing this second SD card slot to the underside of the Spectrum Next mainboard, which you shouldn't really undertake unless you've got a bit of experience drag soldering surface mount components. The same goes for all of these upgrades, if you're not comfortable with the risk, don't do it. So clearly we're going to need to take the mainboard out of its case and we covered that in episode 2 of the series. There's a link on the screen if you want to pop off and watch that first. And with the board in front of us we can take note of where all our components are going to go starting with the real time clock. The kit costs around £4 UK or $5 US and there's a link in the description of where I got this one from. As we saw at the start there are several components to fit to enable the RTC to function. There's the oscillator an IC socket, the IC that goes in that socket, the battery holder. The speaker is attached to the mainboard by a 4 pin header and it's oriented this way round with the speaker firing downward through the holes in the mainboard. The speaker has a clip connection to the headers but we'll have to solder these headers to the board. We'll also need to find a way to hold the speaker in place as there are no mounts or screws provided. And finally the SD card slot on the underside of the board. This is by far the trickiest but also most useful of these upgrades. But as I said before you might want to get someone else to do this for you. So let's warm up the soldering iron and get stuck in. I like to start with the most difficult pieces first to get them out of the way. I'm setting the temperature to a comfortable 330 degrees centigrade as I don't want to damage the main board. I'm using a Rosen Core 0.6mm solder and my standard 3mm wedge tip which I'll pre-tin and wipe away to prepare it for the job. We'll spray the work area with some IPA and give it a good scrub to make sure we have a nice clean surface to solder to. Some flux on the pads will allow the solder to flow more freely and minimise the amount of time we have to hold heat to the board. We'll add some solder to the pads and tin them ready to accept the component before offering it up and applying heat to one corner, melting the solder and securing the part. Once the part is secure we can work around the other corners and firmly attach the component. It's vital when doing this that everything is lined up correctly as the pins for the actual data connections are very small and when drag soldering we need to ensure we don't have any shorts. Each of these pins is less than a millimetre wide so a steady hand is needed. Next up is the internal piezo speaker. This is a through hole component so a lot simpler than the SD card to fit but to be honest it's not going to provide the best quality of sound so I may revisit this at some point in the future. Because of this I'll only be fixing the speaker itself with a bit of captain tape rather than something more permanent and difficult to undo. Our last upgrade today is the real time clock module which is also a set of standard through hole components although the oscillator pins are very close to each other so again we'll need to be careful not to leave a solder bridge between them. We'll start with the IC socket and I'm not really focusing on the actual soldering techniques here as I'm sure there are many tutorials on that across the interweb but please leave a comment if you'd like me to do a video on this in the future. With the socket in we'll move on to the battery holder and this is a simple two hole connection and the orientation is clearly marked on the board. And finally we'll pop the oscillator in and bend it over so it lies flat against the board. We'll hold this in place with a bit of tape so that it doesn't move when we're soldering it in place. A few seconds later and it's in and we're done with the soldering. But we do need to check that we haven't made any mistakes so we'll just clip these legs and then start some checks. We'll put our multimeter into continuity mode, like this. And then we'll walk our way around the joints we've made, ensuring that no two pins next to each other are bridged, indicated by a noise from the multimeter. It seems all is well. 
So with all of the final upgrades in place and a freshly FAT32 formatted 64GB SD card installed in the second slot, it's time to put the next back together and test it all works. Powering up our necks for the first time after taking a soldering iron to our insides is a little nerve wracking, but the boot screen and welcome menu show us that we haven't killed our next. And also it seems our freshly soldered SD card slot is at least visible to the system, as next ZXOS appears to have allocated a drive letter, D. Drive A is assigned for use with CPM, which we'll cover in a later video. Drive C is assigned to our primary SD card slot on the side of the machine, which stores our operating system. And drive M is assigned to the RAM disk. Let's dive into the command line and see if our second SD card slot, drive D, is fully working. By issuing the command cat tab, the next will show us all the storage devices connected to the next and their partitions. Doing this shows us that we have devices 0, 1, 5 and 6. 0 and 1 are all of the IDE DOS partitions on the primary and secondary SD cards. 5 and 6 are all the FAT32 partitions on those cards. Devices 0 and 1 aren't mounted by default, so we'll just focus on devices 5 and 6, both of our SD card file systems. Typing cat ASN will show us a simpler view. For example, drive D shows as assigned to device 6, and the second SD card label, next EXT. Looking good so far. Also note that this command doesn't show the unmounted IDE DOS partitions. Let's change our working directory to the new D drive using the load D colon command in quotes. And then issuing the cat command will show all the files on this drive. Currently none, so we get the no files found message. So let's type in a simple program and try to save it to disk. A one liner version of the standard hello world will suffice but perhaps with a more on-brand message. Perfect. I'll resist adding a 20 go to 10 line, even though I really want to. Let's now try and save this down to our current working drive, which is our freshly installed SD card, as rules.bass. A cat command shows us the file sitting there, looking all proud as punch and I'm pretty happy to. Typing the new command clears the memory that holds the basic programs. So now let's try and load that program back in. And we do this with the load command, which is successful. And then running the program tells us what we already knew. The RetroShack rules. Chalking that modification down to a success, let's turn our attention to the real-time clock which, if enabled and working, will be showing us the time on this screen, which it isn't. To get it to do so, we have to go into the command line and initialize the real-time clock system with the dot time hyphen di command. This command wipes the RTC signatures from the chip and sets it up to accept a date and time, which we do with the dot time and dot date commands, like this. Once the date and time have been set, calling up the menu to exit from the command line shows us that we now have a nice timestamp on all the menus. With the real-time clock now installed, all files we save will be timestamped accordingly. And it's just nice to have a clock. I can let you know by the way that the internal speaker works just fine too. It's just far too quiet, so I'm glad I didn't glue it in. I'll probably fit a better speaker with a volume control in some future episode. Now let's close this episode out by grabbing the correct time off the internet. First make sure you're connected to your Wi-Fi, instructions for how to do this are in part 2 of this series and there should be a link on the screen if you want to pop off and take a look. Presuming we are connected, in the command line type .nxtp space time .nxtel .org space 12300 space hyphen z equals utc and press enter. Lo and behold, through the magic of the interweb, we've grabbed the correct date and time and fed it back into our real-time clock. It's worth doing this every now and again, or as part of your startup process, as the next isn't that great at keeping totally accurate time. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications of new content. 
please leave your comments and suggestions and we'll see you next time in the shack. Until then, goodbye.